Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Manager for Maddie's Institute. We hope you enjoy tonight pre tonight's presentation, How to Stop Itching in Shelter and Foster Home Dogs. Our presenter is Dr. Karen Moriello, Clinical Associate Professor of Dermatology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. She is widely recognized as an expert in the field of dermatology. Before we get started, we have some housekeeping items we should cover. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the presentation. Dr. Moriello will answer as many of those questions as she can at the end, but please don't wait to ask your questions. Ask them early because questions asked in the last few minutes will not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the help icon at the bottom of your screen. You'll also see other little images at the bottom, along with the help button. These are widgets that will take you to the resources that we wanted to share with you. Located in the green resource file at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a printable certificate of attendance with no quiz required. Veterinarians and vet techs will receive their race CE certificates via email within two weeks of this presentation. You can also find the presentation handout and the evaluation survey in the same file. Please be sure to check them out. Before I turn things over to Dr. Moriello, I wanted to say a few words about Maddie's Fund. We are the nation's leading funder of shelter medicine education, and it is our goal to help save the lives of all of our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. Our founders, Dave and Cheryl Duffield, were going through a difficult time in their life, but they were sustained by the unconditional love of their little dog named Maddie. She gave them such joy that they promised her that if they ever made any money, they would give back to her kind. Their dreams did come true, and they made good on their promise by creating Maddie's Fund in honor of their cherished companion and the special bond that they shared. We hope you can use what you learn here tonight to continue the good work that you do for animals. Dr. Moriello, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Lynn, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank Maddie's for inviting me. It's a very big honor. And I'd like to thank everyone who is attending and listening to this because I know that you took time out of your really busy life uh, to spend some time uh, with me. So um, tonight's topic is about um, itching or paritis and how to manage it in shelter and foster home dogs. And this is a really timely topic because itching is the number one cause of um, problems, skin problems in dogs. So, you know, here we have this little bitty dog brought in, and this is actually a little rescue dog, and um, we were able to do some help. And, but it was really hard to get this dog placed in a, in a foster home to, uh, that was willing to, to take care of them. So, you know, one of the things I want to know is, like, what would be your... What would be your objection to taking um, this little dog into foster care? So, Lynn, I think this is where you jump in. Yes, I, I didn't see my um, slide change, Dr. Moriello, but we have our first poll question. <laughs> Why would this itchy dog be difficult to place in foster care? So you should answer on your screen, not in the Q&A box, but we are asking you to join in and give us your opinion. Why would this itchy dog be difficult to place in foster care? Is it the concerns that the dog may have ringworm? Concerns the dog may have contagious mites and or fleas? Itchy dogs take more time to care for than dogs with other medical and surgical problems. Or the ick factor, greasy, smelly, skin, ears, scabs, hair, hair loss, and the family. Or other. So let us know. Answer on your screen. Why would this itchy dog be difficult to place in foster care? We'll go ahead and look at the results. Oh, well, that's pretty interesting. I think it's the yeah. ick factor that took the <laughs> prize. Good, good. Uh, yes, no, that's really great. Um, uh, I think those are, my, those are the two things I would have guessed about uh, in, uh, in foster care because those are you know, also the things that, you know, for private families that are also a big, uh, a big concern. So let's go and get on with it. So... Um, Itch, what is it? Itch is a sensation, and 
the difference between itch and pain is just a degree of, of severity. It's transmitted by the same kind of uh, neurons. And so, you know, itch is actually defined as the desire to scratch something that is bothersome. And all dogs itch. But the real question is, is how much is, is too much? And that is a very personal uh, question and very um, interpretive. You know, everyone has a little different tolerance for it. So one of the things that we have done in veterinary medicine is actually come up with a way to help get a little bit more standardized information about, like, how itchy is your pet? How much? What do we need to chase? What's bothering you? And what we have here is a little canine um, itch scale or parietal scale. And it allows us to, at the very bottom, if we're talking to someone who's managing an animal, especially if they're doing it over the phone and, you know, we're trying to give long-term care, they, they kind of look at this and say, well, the dog isn't normal. And they kind of read each of the descriptors and they give me an idea of how severe the itching is. And so mild itching is one degree of, of concern, but if somebody starts telling me the dog is extremely itchy and they tell me they're not sleeping at night or the dog isn't, um, you know, can't be distracted from the itching, that's hugely uh, of a concern. And it's the amount of itch that gives you an idea about what the problem may or may not be. So this also becomes a really important tool, and you can download many of these from the Internet, in working when you're working with animals and you put them into foster care as a sort of a response uh, to treatment. So and we'll show you how to use that in a little bit. Okay. Oops. Lynn, I did it again. I'm a control freak. <laughs> okay. Well, we are at our next poll question, and we would like you to answer this on your screen. What do you think is the most common cause of itching in dogs? Is that fleas, flea allergy, contagious mites like scabies, dermatophor, uh ringworm, <laughs> allergies, or I don't know. So fleas, flea allergy, contagious mites. Ringworm, allergies, don't know. Please answer on your screen. What do you think is the most common cause of itching in dogs? And there's the results, Dr. Moriello. Absolutely. We, we have an audience here that has actually had to suffer with a lot of itchy dogs. So um, this is good. Actually, by far, the number one cause of itching um, in dogs is, is parasites and particularly fleas. And if you attack that, you actually deal with most of the problems um, that you're dealing with. However, allergies are right up there, and those are the ones that are very hard to manage long term, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, so it's really important um, to talk about what the major causes of itch in dogs are, and I've listed them as parasites, infections, and allergies, and other causes. And they're listed in the order of importance, with parasites being the most common, and infections being the next most common with allergies. Now, the other causes, we're not going to talk a lot about those, but they're things that are pretty much easily recognized by you in your practices or at home. And they're, they're things that look very alarming. Um, they're medical problems um, or other type of like foreign bodies, that type of situation, and rarely some very life-threatening illnesses. But this is the, goes from the most common to um, less common and from easy to treat uh, to more difficult to treat. So let's start out with parasites. So parasites break down into two really big groups. The first one are the easy-to-see ones, like fleas, lice, and ticks, things that you can actually see and sometimes feel, and then things that need a microscope, which are, which are mites. With fleas, um, this is, again, the most common cause of itch in dogs, and I'm always very surprised at um, the number of times that um, people fall essentially um, fall into the trap of television advertising, making you think that you need thousands and thousands of my, uh, fleas to cause itching in dogs, when in fact, really, um, you, most dogs that have got flea problems don't have hundreds and hundreds of fleas on them. And there was actually a study that looked at flea allergic dogs and dogs that just had fleas and they were all in the same room, and they found out that there was less than one flea on the flea allergic dogs compared to the other dogs. So flea al allergy... Um, dogs that chew and bite at themselves actually kind of hunt these little fleas down and eat them. And so when you look at these dogs, you may not notice it. But this is a huge problem. It's also a big medical problem because you can have, um, depending upon where you live in the country, you can have flea bite anemia, which is, can be life-threatening. And I've seen German shepherds with very low um, pack cell volumes. The next one is lice. And here, a very important thing to note, um, we know it, but it still has to be um, emphasized, is that lice are species-specific. So if the dog has lice, 
the dog has lice. Not the children's not at risk, the cats aren't at risk, and vice versa. And lice are something which is, you know, looking at the black dog, or I've got my fingers around it, you can see little white specks, and those are lice. They are really that big. Lice is oftentimes considered to be a disease of neglect, but that's not necessarily true. It's basically a disease where you've got lots of crowding. And in this day and age, you can have animals in shelters, you can have daycares, you can have dog parks, lots of places for animals to encounter it. And also, um, animals can encounter, canines can encounter the dog louse from other wild canines like coyotes. So that is, you know, another source of it. Um, lice, um, one way to actually kind of identify lice is you can actually find the nits on the hairs, those are the little eggs. And those can be kind of hard to remove. And one little take-home tip is if you have a dog with lice, if you do a rinse with one to four um, vinegar and water first, you can soften that um, bond, that glue, from the lice knit on the hairs before you go ahead and wash them um, with a, a flea shampoo to help remove a lot of the debris and then treat them. And lice can be treated with a lot of different things, but lice are very flea control responsive. And so it helps to use a spot on and a, because the lice are on the hairs, to go ahead and use a, um, like a flea spray. But it's very, very treatable. And then, of course, there's ticks. Most of us, um, you know, find ticks one or two at a time. But occasionally, animals will come in with massive tick infestations. And very commonly, what I find ticks to, to really like is they like to get into the folds and cracks and crevices. So it's the paws and the ear folds. And they can cause an awful lot of damage. Uh, and ticks not only cause problems from their, their just initial in being um, attached, but after removal, you can have a tick bite reaction at the site, and this can be really itchy. And these tick bite reactions can be like mini little nodules under the skin. And so sometimes that, um, you know, if you have an animal that's really itchy and you just feel something kind of in the dermis, like a little, little hard dot, that may have been where they've had ticks. And those animals would benefit from, um, obviously, tick control and flea control, but a topical glucocorticoid, and you sometimes even see just a little bit of a, of a lesion there. And it can take months for those to go away. But post-tick bite reactions are pretty problematic in some dogs. Okay, then we get to the ones that everybody's really kind of problem, worried about, the ones you can't see, the ones you're really worried that if you take a dog home, your, animal's gonna, your other family members are, and dogs are going to be at risk. So the first and biggest one is scabies. And sarcoptes, the hallmark of this is severe itch. And the other hallmark of it is it likes thinly haired areas. So it starts on the, the belly and chest of dogs on the ventrum. And the way I remember it is sarcoptes is um, at the end of the um, alphabet, uh, S, and ventrum is on V. So that's how I kind of keep them uh, in my mind. And that becomes important with another mite here. But sarcoptes mites are very small. They're very difficult to find. Um, you may be found one um, mite um, every time, every ten times you look. So this is a disease which is diagnosed by response to therapy very commonly, and it's really appropriate to do this. One thing that's important to remember is that the treatment for scabies, many of the spot-on flea control products that can be used can be used to treat scabies, but it won't work with just one application and not at zero and 30 days. You have to do them every two weeks. So you may have actually have exactly what you need in your practice or in your shelter to treat these dogs, but you just need to change the interval with which you're te treating them. Okay. And then we come up to the other mite uh, that can cause a lot of itching, and that's Chylotiella, or the walking dandruff mite. And this mite looks like little scales on the skin um, or in the hair coat. And the hallmark here is it's less itchy, but it's pretty much scales an itch on the back. And so Pilotiella begins with a C, and the, the back D, uh, B and D are very close to each other. So that's how you kind of keep it separated, in, at least in trying to remember. So scabies is ventral, severe itching. Pilotiella is on the back, and it's less severe itching. And both of these can cause itching in people. Um, this mite, again, is very responsive to flea control products and very responsive um, to the spot on, but again, we need to use it a little bit more uh, frequently. And it's a major thing to, to, to keep in mind because there's another disease of dogs that causes itching, um, that causes a lot of scaling. Uh, and then we get with ear mites. Ear mites just aren't 
in the ears. They can also migrate around and cause a lot of head and neck itching. Uh, they're also not just in puppies. You can find them in adult dogs, um, and we oftentimes forget to look for them because we're not we're thinking of you know the classic um, puppy or kitten with a little crusting and debris in the ears. Ear mite itching is caused from a hypersensitivity, and a small number of mites can cause a lot of itching and a lot of chronic ear disease, which we're going to talk about in the next um, session. Okay. And then there is the one that's really important, and this is Demodex. And this is important for so many reasons, because dogs with Demodex, which is a mite that normally lives in the skin, is supposed to be there. But it will oftentimes be manifested in shelters and in dogs that are stressed because physiological stress or illness will allow this mite to proliferate in the skin in large numbers, causing disease. And this mite lives in the hair follicle, so the disease it causes looks like anything that affects the hair follicle. You can have redness, you can have hair loss, you can have hair breakage. And when this is diagnosed, the real question is, is you know, can we cure this dog or not? And the answer is you don't know until you get the animal on treatment and you get them into a less stressed environment. And the clinical signs can vary from being very mild um, to very severe like the little dog that's all pink and red in the corner. And the nickname of this is, is Red Mange. In dermatology, when we're looking and answer, asking questions about dogs, we're really trying to determine are they itchy or not, and then we're looking to work up an itchy dog. We're looking to find out is it, does it have demodex or not because that's a very important disease to try to treat, and it's a long-term um, disease to treat. I'm happy to say there's a lot of therapies out there, and where we used to not be able to give dogs a really good quality of life long-term, we can do that now. Okay, so parasites, the most common. For the most part, they're treatable and curable diseases. And also, they're things that with you doing routine flea control in your family, with your family pets, your animals are not at risk. Demodex is not contagious. And so, again, um, with a little bit of thought ahead of time, your family members are not at risk and you can take that itchy dog in. Now, the second cause of itching are infections of the skin. And the one infection of the skin that most people are most aware of is ringworm. And that is one, you know, because we know about it in cats, and also it causes a lot of hair loss. It's a disease of contagion. But ha I'm happy to tell you that ringworm in dogs is not very common, and when you see lesions that you think look like ringworm, they're really something which is not contagious, which is a bacterial infection, staph infection, or yeast. And staph and yeast infections commonly go hand in hand key points about these things to remember is that these staph infections and yeast infections are part of normal body flora, and they're overgrowing because the status quo has been changed, and not everything's living in harmony, so they overgrow, and each one facilitates the growth of the other, and they can cause intense itching, and they can look a lot alike. It's not contagious to other animals, and again, it's commonly misdiagnosed as ringworm, and very importantly, it's not a zoonotic problem. As far as if you have an animal with staph or yeast infections, it's just pure hand hygiene. Just soap and water will keep you and um, children and family um, safe. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, now, what is bacterial infection? Bacterial infection, everybody who's listening has actually seen this. They just may not actually recognize it. It is what the rash is that you see on the ventral belly and thinly haired areas of dogs. It can look like a pimple. It can look like a bump. But a bacterial infection essentially is is pustules or acne or pimples to be very direct. And you'll see it in the thinly haired areas on the ventrum. But there's a few more classic presentations. Up in the upper left-hand corner um, are classic pustules. And this is actually um, a very common presentation in puppies um, when, when they're um, being separated from mom. Oftentimes, as either from grooming or stress, we'll get these big, juicy pustules. I'm a dermatologist, so everything that looks epic and juicy is, is very exciting to me. Um, but this is very common, and it's easily treated with shampooing. Um, many times those pustules, in, if you see them in older dogs, will crust over and just give you lots of scaling, such as um, you're seeing up in the upper right-hand corner and the lower left. So scaling, so when you see scaling, another major thing to think about besides that calotelomitis, could it be a bacterial infection? And then, of course, there's one of my favorite uh, patients of all time, Fred the Giant Basset, um, weighed nearly 100 pounds, and he came in for resistant ringworm, and what he had, all those little focal areas of hair loss on there, those, that was all a bacterial infection of the skin. 
And so he is was was cured with a course of antibiotics and went on to be the delight of his family. Um, now, another cause of itching that's really common is yeast. Two decades ago, we didn't know that this was a big problem. Ten years ago, we were only beginning to realize it. Now we know that dogs that itch commonly have yeast. The yeast normally live in the mouth. They live around the, um, the um, genital areas, um, urinary tract areas, anywhere the dog can lick, they can move yeast to an area. So if they're chewing and biting from fleas, they can transplant it. The moisture will cause overgrowth of yeast. So yeast on the skin under the neck is very painful. Um, it's very odorous. Anybody who's had to deal with a really ick factor in dogs, lots of times that's the yeast and grease. Um, yeast in the ears is very typical um, and very common. Everyone recognizes it in Cocker Spaniels, but it's also the, one of the most major causes of recurrent um, ear itching. I'm making my little case for my ear seminar next in a, later this year. And then those dogs that chew their feet that um, are just crazy foot chewers, many times the cause of that is itch um, from yeast and not behavioral causes. Okay. Now, the rash that you see, um, a good place to look for it if you're trying to you know, look for itching, in, you know, causes of itch in a, uh, a dog, is to actually get them on their side and look at the thinly haired areas on the inner part of their arms. And lots of times you'll see scaling and redness and little red bumps. And those are the hallmark signs of infection in the skin. Um, again, um, crusting and scaling and hair loss, hallmark signs of infection. And this is really important for foster families because many of the long-term chronic dogs that come in get outbreaks of this. And if you can learn to recognize the early signs of this and start a bathing protocol, you can stop a major relapse in its tracks and give these dogs a really good quality of life. Now, hot spots. Hot spots are, are pretty common, and they are actually caused by overgrowth of bacterial infections and you'll see them, and they can literally develop within just 15, 20 minutes, um, and they can become very crusty and very painful. And um, what they, we now know that, you know, they're not, um, you know, behavioral causes. They're actually caused by a medical cause of itch. And if you see a dog in your care with a hot spot, the thing to think about is, is where, where is it located? If it's uh, located around the head and the ear flaps, that dog probably the underlying trigger for the itch is probably ears. Hind quarters is likely to be fleas. If you have a history of a dog with recurrent hot spots right on the muzzle, that tends to be allergies. So that can be, you know, a really big clue as to what's causing it. Um, but the treatment is still the same. We want to treat this as if it's a bacterial infection. And we want to go ahead and um, gently uh, soak and bathe those areas to remove the crust. Some of these dogs are so painful it needs to be done. You know, the cl initial cleaning needs to be done under an a sedative or anesthesia, um, but and we also want to, after we get it cleaned up, is we want to put a triple antibiotic ointment on there because why some of the pain comes from these is because there's little nerve endings that are all free. It's like a skin knee, um, just all free and firing away, causing not only itch but pain. And if you put an ointment on there, it's like putting a bandage on something. It helps alleviate the itching. Now, somebody out there is probably going to ask the question, you know, like, can you give some steroids to these dogs? What, what do you do for the itching? Well, if, it's, if the dog's in an environment where um, it's safe um, to administer um, an oral glucocorticoid or a topical glucocorticoid, sure, we can definitely do that. But I have found that many of these dogs that we really want to give steroids to do really well in a few, in 15, 20 minutes with some topical therapy and some cleansing um, of the area. Um, but for humane reasons, um, for the veterinarians in the, uh, in the audience, um, it's a judgment call, and it may be the thing that is absolutely necessary. But we're only talking about one or two days, and then going after the, whatever the trigger is. Now, what about ringworm? It is actually overdiagnosed in dogs. Dogs that come in that seem to have these recurrent ringworm episodes, what you're really looking at is a bacterial infection of the skin. And you'll see these little focal areas of hair loss, um, or just hair loss that's sort of broken and, and scaly. In adult dogs, it's uncommon to see it. Um, where you do see, you know, ringworm is more in puppies. Now, these dogs here, uh, every dog I'm showing you here was actually presented for a problem with ringworm, and I can see where it's very, very suspicious. It's circular, it's patchy hair loss, but um, these are bacterial infections of the skin, even if they just look like patchy hair loss or, the little, again, the little bulldog that looks pretty dramatic there. Um, if you think it's ringworm in the dog, it's probably a bacterial infection, and you're best off 
um, you know, 99% of the time you're going to be right to treat for that. However, you do have a ringworm risk group, and those are puppies and juvenile dogs, or dogs that have come from situations where you really do have overcrowding and really poor health of the whole population. But if you look at these puppies and you look at these lesions, they're a little bit different. They're a little bit raised. They're up on the nose. We don't, dogs don't have hair follicles up on that nose area very easily, and they don't usually get um, bacterial pyoderma up on their nose or on the bridge of their nose or on their ears. Um, and you can see here that it, it doesn't look quite so widespread. It's sort of, um, and it looks a lot crustier. But it is the age of the animal that really gives you uh, the clue. And dogs get microsporum canis as a big cause. They also get trichophyton um, as a big one, and they also get um, microsporum gypsum. Um, we've talked about those in other seminars, but they're very treatable and curable. Um, and again, in puppies, um, if you're used to looking for ringworm in, in kittens and that, it won't be that difficult to identify. Now, in an adult dog, can you have ringworm? You bet. But these dogs almost always have the exact same history, and that is that they are sick, and they are debilitated, and they have some type of physiological, physiological stress. This dog had a GI disease, and he couldn't absorb nutrients, and was really struggling, and he just really, his, his skin immune system couldn't function. You know, the skin requires the most energy from the body and from nutrition, and when the body is stressed, it's going to push all the nutrition that it needs to the brain and more vital organs, and the skin just sort of gets, you know, the short end of the stick there. It doesn't, it doesn't get anything. So then you end up with recurrent infections and opportunistic infections. And the treatment for dermatophytosis in these adult dogs is really no different than in, in cats. Um, but for the foster families looking at this, it's very, very uncommon uh, for this to be a big problem, I process a lot of fungal cultures in my laboratory um, from dogs that are, people are concerned about, and it's very uncommon to, to have this to be a problem. So don't, don't let that be the obstacle. Now, the third big group, if we've got parasites and infections, the third group are allergies. And again, the big one is flea allergy dermatitis. And if animals are getting flea control, it's going to be probably the least likely thing you're going to be battling as um, in the shelter or in foster family. Allergic dermatitis to pollens and mold is really, really common. And for those people, I think it was like 40%, um, they're recognizing um, the, the allergic dogs, the dogs with environmental allergies. And here, those environmental allergies can either appear seasonally or year-round. And um, we'll show some, some clinical signs of things that will make you suspicious of that. Um, but seasonal or year-round. So dogs that have got seasonal aller seasonal problems, the only other things that cause seasonal itching in a dog, if you get that history, might be fleas. And that's going to be in a dog that's not getting treated year-round with year-round flea control. Now, food allergy or adverse food reactions, these are year-round, and most of the dogs that you may be um, getting surrendered to you, you might not have that history. But it is also very, very uncommon. It's something we always want to look at um, and we're always tempted to look at, but from a bring a good quality of life to dogs um, and doing something which is, is beneficial, it's, it's not a high-yield um, thing to pursue. And then the last cause of things that are allergic is something called atopic-like dermatitis. And these are dogs that look every bit like they have allergies, but no matter how hard we try, we, you know, with blood testing or skin testing or even if we do food trials, we cannot identify the cause of um, the itch um, in, this, in these dogs. You can't identify the allergen. And so we just treat them medically. For those animals that are going to be in long-term care until you maybe actually get a diagnosis, these are, I, I mentioned that because this is where you do want to go through good flea control and look for environmental allergies. And maybe if you've got the dog for long enough, a food trial, because these atopic-like dogs, there is no therapy that we can give that helps um, change the course of the disease the only thing we can do is manage them medically. And these dogs have good quality of life, but that's important when you're trying to rehome dogs is to be able to tell people, you know, where are we in the diagnosis if we're down to allergies. Now, uh, flea allergy, um, both of these dogs can have flea allergy. That little dog on the, on the one side, he just has a few fleas on him. The other dog has the classic presentation for everybody who's down in the flea belt, uh, recognizes this at, you know, probably 50 yards that triangular area of hair loss. Okay. 
after flea allergy, everything else looks the same. Food allergy is clinically indistinguishable from environmental allergies and is going to be clinically indistinguishable from that last category of atopic-like um, dermatitis. And so this is where, you know, we have to come up with a triage plan to kind of figure out, you know, what do we have, you know, what's treatable, what's curable, and what's lifelong management. Okay. So in the situations that we're in um, with these dogs, um, we don't usually have the benefit of or the time or the luxury of a, a two-page questionnaire and a lot of medical history to go data mining in. But the questions that you really want to ask right away is, is the dog ill or does it look unwell? I mean, what is your judgment? Because a sick dog that's itchy has other problems going on, and that might be one that has got demodex that may be causing some itch um, or has got a recurrent infection of the skin. But if it looks ill, you need to look for that medical problem because the skin is the least of your problems if the dog is sick. Then the other thing is, you know, try to glean any kind of a medication history of uh, for any disease, you know, what kind of pills are they giving? Do you have receipts? Do you have any records? Uh, do you, are people surrendering bottles? Because if you're seeing shampoos, if you're seeing prednisone, if you're seeing antibiotics, if you, you, those are things that tell you, oh, people have been battling recurrent skin problems. If you don't have anything to work with, you can still work with that. But having a drug history may help you decide whether or not you need to do something like a bacterial culture of the skin, especially if they've had a lot of, of antibiotics. Is there any history of flea control or parasite control? If you don't, that's golden because it means you probably can do something really helpful with something as simple um, as flea control at our point of entry. And then any history of contagion. And that may or may not come up with at the time of surrender, but it may come up with when animals are in shelters. And, you know, dogs that make you itch after contact. One of the first things to think about is if, you're it if someone is reporting being itchy after touching a dog is, What's the breed? Because any of those dogs with really short, prickly hair coats, particularly the Sharpe breeds and any of those, they, their hair coat actually is kind of a contact irritant. And so everybody's itchy after that. But after that, the things that cause itching after contact is, well, fleas can definitely do that. Um, but most of us know about the flea bites that get around your wrist or your ankles and that. And usually if the fleas are biting you, they're probably, you know, pretty obvious on the pet. And then there's scabies. Well, in my experience, people who are itchy from scabies, um, maybe um, a family that's had a dog that's been itchy for a long time, they've had it as a puppy, it was undiagnosed scabies, and the whole family's itchy, or we've actually made a diagnosis or we suspect scabies, and now we're asking people to do a lot of, you know, topical treatments, and now they're getting their arms in contact with it. So, you know, if you've, if you've got a dog and you've been doing something, and all of a sudden you're itchy afterward, it may be that scabies is, that dog does have scabies, and now you're starting to, you know, react to it because you're exposed. And the same thing with chylotiella. You know, chylotiella, those mites are a lot more mobile than scabies mites. They can actually crawl around a little bit more. And so people with chylotiella exposure tend to have a lot more itching on their arms and, and, uh, and abdomen and that. Ear mites are actually, you don't realize it, but ear mites absolutely positively can cause itching if, if there's a long enough um, exposure. And all those little Q-tips and material that we're removing from um, your mite uh, pets, we need to dispose of that properly because that can cause itching. And a lot of people with itching on their hands and wrists up in the laboratory or your mini lab where you're doing things, that may be ear mites. And one that we overlook are chiggers. Chiggers, where they're prominent, um, you know, are, are little mites that are outside. They don't really cause much problems on dogs, but dogs can get them in their hair coat and then cause a lot of intense itching on people. And the cool thing about chiggers is if you take a flea comb through it and you see little orange dots, that's what they are, and they respond beautifully uh, to flea control. So that, that works. So those are really the big ones to look at. And, you know, taking an animal into your home, you got flea control. We're going to have a, an itchy dog triage plan, which is going to deal with scabies and chylotiella. Um, so, you know, again, um, the risk here um, is absolutely manageable. Okay. So... A big question is, is does a dog itch? And when you're asking this question, a lot of people think when they think about itching, you know, they think about when they itch. Well, remember, dogs don't have thumbs, so they, so they really their amount of itching, they really can't, you know, dig in and scratch. But what they do is they lick, they bite, they roll, they scoot. And so you need to ask those behaviors. Are they rubbing, rolling, licking, scooting? And ask them in different ways, and especially nibbling, jumping up and acting as if something stuck them in the, 
the skin or bit them. Those are all things which indicate some type of itch. Another one are dogs that may be being reported as gagging a lot. Oh, the dog's choking. Or the dog looks like it's trying to, you know, hack up a hairball. Those dogs are licking and chewing and getting hair caught in the back of their throat, and they're trying to gag it up, literally. And that's a, a sort of a, a clue that dogs um, may be itching. And then is there excessive shedding? Now, there's normal shedding and excessive shedding from a disease. In a, nor- in a dog that's normally shedding, you don't have hair loss because a new hair is pushing out the old hair. So there's a hair right there to, to, you know, to replace it. But if you've got a lot of shedding and the hairs are broken off, and when you look at the dog, there's these little areas of, of patchy hair loss, that's excessive shedding adding to and, and most likely caused by an itchy skin disease. So those are some of the biggest clues, the questions that you have in whatever limited time you can get it. Now, most of the time when you're working up itchy dogs, you're really looking at your clues from your skin examination. And a couple of things to think about. If the animal's otherwise healthy, healthy, you know, and you've got a dermatology book over there in front of you, you know, the first thing they're going to say is find the problem. Well, I'm going to tell you, the most common problem in dogs is itch, and itch trumps everything else. You know, bumps, lumps, ear disease, anything of those dermatological problems, scaling. If it's itchy, if you chase itch, more than likely you're going to find out that all those clinical signs, the hair loss, the dark pigment, whatever you're seeing, is somehow related to the itching. Solve that, and most of the time you're going to be in a really, really uh, good position to solving that dog's skin problem. And if you actually look at any of those flow charts in the dermatology books or you get on the websites, the first question they ask is, is a dog itchy? And then it says, go to the itch flow chart. So go there. Now, important to remember is itch almost always leads to secondary infections. And many, many dogs um, are itchy. The cause or the trigger from itch is long gone. Maybe it was getting wet. Maybe it was a little bit of flea bites. But there's infection perpetuating the itch. And so when we're looking at these dogs with itchy skin, we're really looking for, do we, can we see a cure it pattern, you know, like scabies is curable, or do we see something like allergies, lifelong manageable disease? Because those are the things that, you know, when you're giving your history back to um, either potential adopters, um, foster families, is, you know, where do we think it is? Do we think it's a curable disease, or do we think it's with something with lifelong management? Okay. Now, um, in working up cases, there's something which I call the dermatology TPR. I simply can't do anything. I just you know, can't really make a good judgment call um, or even give a triage plan unless I have some information. And we do this on every case, every time. Once we realize the animal's not you know, in a life-threatening situation, we get in there, we do a hair plucking, we do an ear swab in um, cytology in mineral oil looking for mites, and we do skin cytology, and we do ear swab cytology. And those four things are really inexpensive and easy to do. And if you do them on every single dog, you're going to get to some clue. And if it's really, really super weird, take a skin biopsy. I don't even have it up here because most of the time, the things you're seeing, this will get you your clues. Now, the first thing we're looking at with our derm TPR and our test is, is there a parasite suspicion? And Widespread hair loss, very inflamed skin. You need to go and you need to look for Demodex. Um, and you need to think about Demodex, Chylotiella, um, scabies, and fleas. And first off in everything is if you have Demodex ruled out, then mostly everything else that follows is going to be responsive to something that's responsive to flea control. Okay. Sometimes um, when you're trying to decide itching, or you're trying to do therapy, you might want to go back to your little itch scale uh, because one of the most itchiest diseases we deal with is scabies. And any dog that no matter what you're doing, no matter how you're, when you look at this dog, he's just going crazy, just will not, can't get his attention, won't sit, won't stay, won't take a cookie, and he's itching, that dog is a scabies suspect. And if you suspect for it, you should always treat for it. All the other parasites are lower on the list. Okay. Now, Skin scrapings have been the hallmark for looking for Demodex mites. However, I'd like to really make a case for what we do is call a hair plucking or hair trichogram. This is easier to do. This is safer to do. You can do this on a lot of dogs that are a lot more difficult to manage, and you get just as good a sample as you do. And what you basically do is collect hairs um, really close to where they're um, just coming out of the skin and pluck them and look at the base in mineral oil and that will help you find Demodex mites. A little dog like this, 
um, that's all red. Um, you can even do something as easy as, if, especially if you don't even have hairs to pluck, you can just gently press, um, squeeze the skin and even put a piece of scotch tape on there and collect that debris and mount that scotch tape over a drop of oil and you will find demodex mites. So you don't always have to go and do a skin scraping. You know, I like skin scraping spatulas, which are little rounded edge tools. Um, I am not a fan at all of skin scraping, of, of doing skin scrapings with scalpel blades. I think there's too much risk for everybody. So I really encourage and teach students now and, and really, you know, make a plea for doing hair trichograms. I think it's the way to go. Now, why is it the way to go? Because I've learned some from hard experience. This dog came with chronic itching of the face. No matter what we did, no matter how hard we worked it up, this dog, we could not possibly figure it out. And so then, you know, we were like, oh, well, let's go ahead. You know, it's an older dog. You know, we've looked at it, but let's do a hair trichogram. I wouldn't want to squeeze this dog's muzzle. I wouldn't want to scrape this dog's muzzle, and I wouldn't even want to go there trying to use a scalpel um, or a skin scraping spatula. But plucking a few hairs was done really quickly, and the dog just, hey, you know, what, what happened there? No big deal. It was easy to do. And when we laid that down, we see, you see the big um, shafts there are hairs, and up there at the top, um, you can see demodex mites, and those are the little darker structures. And this, um, that are up there, they kind of look like long um, alligators, what they look like to me. Very, very easy to find, and you, if you look at the distal hair shafts, you'll find these. And you can do this much quicker and much faster, and, and a lot less, you know, you don't need as much restraint as many people, because if the dog's really painful or very difficult to manage, you can use a lot of restraint needed just to get a sample, and then you don't get a really good sample. Well, with this, you're almost guaranteed that you will. Ear swab cytology, we're always looking for ear mites, but I'll tell you, I found a lot of um, ear uh, dogs with, gen with itchy ears and then subsequently demodex on the body by looking at the ear mineral oil swab and finding demodex in the mineral oil. So that's really very helpful. And if you do it every time, all the time, then you won't miss those cases. Now, the other big thing is, is what about, like, infections? There's no question this dog has the ick factor, okay? No question this dog is smelly, and no question that this dog, if you look at it, it's pigmented, it's red. This is the kind of dog that, of course, it's going to have my bacterial and yeast overgrowth. You're going to have something there. You're going to have a suspicion of that. So these are the dogs that we want to do, you know, cytologies on. Sometimes it's really easy, and you can find a lot of, you know, goo and exudate there. This little dog was actually didn't come to dermat. Its primary problem was dermatology, but it, it came into the neurology service because the face was so itchy. It looked as if it was having seizures. So while neurology was looking at it, they said, oh, you know, this dog's got the ick factor. Go get the derm team. And we did our little test, and we found lots and lots of yeast. The dog was scheduled for a big workup the next day, but after 24 hours of an antifungal therapy and treatment, it was 50% better, and we discovered this dog's problem had yeast overgrowth on the face. You know, more is a for not looking than not knowing, but sometimes, you know, the most dramatic things can be caused by some of the simplest things you can do. Now, what about bacterial infections? Again, it is really important, um, if, if you take anything home from this, it's being able to recognize the clinical lesions that are suspicious of yeast and particularly bacterial infections, the scales in the hair coat, those circular kind of spreading scales, um, uh, scales that are being pierced by hairs, that's all very classic for bacterial pyoderma, you know, and that is, you know, clinically strong enough evidence that you've got a bacterial infection. Those foot lickers, think about yeast and look underneath those nail beds because you'll find it there. Same thing with ear debris and ear itch. Now, skin cytology is easy to do. A lot of people say they have problems with it, but really you're taking a glass slide and you're, you're pressing it to the skin kind of squeezing it between your index finger and thumb. And when you stain it, you know you got a good sample if you can almost see like your, your thumbprint there in the stain slide. Now, for those dogs that have difficult areas to get a sample where, or you can't put a glass slide, or an animal you simply cannot really, you know, safely get a glass slide there, you got clear scotch tape. It, everybody should have rolls of it everywhere, and it's wonderful. You just stick it to the skin, use a clothespin, and you just stain that in your um, regular diff quick, skipping the fixative, letting it dry thoroughly, and then you've got just as good as, of a sample as a glass slide. And it's actually much cheaper because everybody knows how expensive glass slides can be. And the only trick to really looking at those 
is to go ahead and put a drop of immersion oil down and then mount that, uh, gla- that uh, scotch tape right over it and then examine it. Now, possibly somebody there learned the technique of doing your scotch tape prep and then putting it directly on the slide and then staining the slide. Don't do that. You don't get good staining. Go to wherever you get your big box stores and your clear scotch, scotch tape and buy one bag of uh, clothespins, a lifetime supply, and you're good to go, and it's much easier to do it that way. Okay, and so what are you looking for? When you're looking at your cytologies, a really big thing you're looking for are yeast, and that's on the right-hand side. And those yeasts are important to look for, and they're going to look different. In the ear, they're going to look like the little peanuts. In the skin, they're going to look like they're rounded up. And the real reason you want to know about the yeast present is because although we try not to give a lot of systemic drugs, and we try to treat things topically, if you have a lot of yeast, it may be that that animal needs a systemic antifungal to get the comfort and the relief. Now, the other thing we're looking for with our cytologies is we're looking for evidence of a bacterial infection, and those are white blood cells or neutrophils with cocci. Um, And that's great if you find it, but oftentimes you only find that if you happen to plaster your your glass slide right over a pustule. If you happen to look over and, and do and sample over a scab or a crust, you may not see that. Um, but again, if you don't see white blood cells and cocci, but you saw those crusts and scales, you've got a pyoderma, treat for it. Okay. Ear swab cytology, staining. Um, you want to do one in staining because you're always looking to see, do I have yeast? And more importantly, do I have other organisms? Um, one thing to remember about when you see you know, white blood cells, white blood cells in a swab from an ear are always alarming because we always think that there's, there's deep infection, which is possibly present, um, or middle ear infection. But in this little dog over here, right at the um, orifice, you can see a little shiny area where it's red and kind of looks um, moist. That's a little area of ulceration. One thing to think about is if you see white blood cells is, you know, is there an area where I might have bumped it or is there an area where there's a focal area of of pus coming out? Because that may help um, determine what you do for treatment. Um, You know, and again, your physical examination is going to really be helpful. Uh, A flashlight is one of your best tools for looking at ears. And what we're looking at for ears, again, is yeast like on the left, and then what you're seeing on the right are some white blood cells, but all that blue are bacteria, cocci, which look like little round M&Ms and rods, uh, which look like um, good and plenties. And when you see rods from an ear swab, that should be considered an alarming finding and it should be considered a really good reason to do a culture because we want to make sure we don't have an organism called pseudomonas. We'll talk a lot more about ears later, but finding and diagnosing those um, you know, pseudomonas ear infections quickly can make or break that dog's chance of keeping, um, getting his ear infections resolved or helping you um, prevent a long-term infection that may, so it doesn't lead to um, a total ear canal ablation. We've, all, we've already talked about using um, scotch tape to find Demodex, um, but this was um, one of the first dogs I tried it on, and um, I even though it looks like a dog with bacterial pyoderma, and it had bacterial pyoderma, it also had demodex, and I was surprised and very happy with that technique. Okay. Now, if you do need to culture, uh, do a bacterial culture, it's, we all know how to do a bacterial culture of a pustule. You know, we just prick it and roll our swab in the pus. But what about when you've got just those crusty, scaly areas? What's the technique there? Well, that, it's not really hard. It looks hard, but it's not. You simply go ahead and take your tip of your culture swab, dip it and moisten it with the transport media, then go to your area, kind of lift a crust or or rub it really aggressively in the scale and making sure that you soil or sample 360 degrees around in that um, cotton tip swab so this way then the laboratory will have an adequate amount to go ahead and spread out in culture. That's all there is to it. There's no more magic than that. Okay. So we're going to start a triage talk here. So the, the big thing about this is, like, what do you do, no matter who you are, what are you doing if you have a dog and you haven't got a clue what's going on? It's just not obvious. Well, again, you always need to be aware of the sick dog, you know, and there's so many things that can cause that. That dog needs, you know, medical illnesses trump the skin right away. You're going to want to rule out um, demodicoses, 
um, because once you have Demodex off of your consideration, um, that makes it easier to, to, to deal with parasites. You want to make sure you don't have ear mites and you're looking for yeast on the skin, yeast on the ears, because you want to find out, you know, do I have so many? I may have to go with systemic therapy. Now, wood slam. Everybody knows um, one of my hobbies is ringworm. What about a wood slam? Wood slams are great. Um, and, again, they're only going to tell you whether or not, you know, a good screening for microsporum canis, but you need to use them with care in greasy um, dogs with the ick factor because you can get a lot of um, false fluorescence from the greasy material on the hair coat. So if you're going to do a wood lamp on a dog with skin disease and you're not sure what's going on, pluck hairs and look from the area that you want to look at and look at the hair the part that comes from in the hair follicle so that you don't get led astray by the greasiness. Fungal cultures. Is a dog at high risk? If the dog's at high risk, it may be money well spent. If your protocol is to always fungal culture, that's fine. But the problem with dogs is that, unlike cats, they have a lot of other um, contaminant organisms on their hair coat, and if you're not really careful and on top of your fungal cultures, that plate can turn red and you can have a lot of false positives really quickly. So if, you know, depending upon what your protocol is, use your fungal culture as needed. If it's a puppy, I think it's, it's reasonable. If you've got high risk and, and, and evidence of contagion or, or some other documented uh, reason for your dog that you're dealing with, sure. Otherwise, that may not be um, money well spent. And then, of course, bacterial cultures. Um, and bacterial cultures of the skin are indicated when you have a known history of a lot of antibiotic usage, particularly floral quinolones um, or some of the, the third-generation cephalosporins. Um, and we will talk about what to do when that's not an option. But they're about $50 to do easily, at least in our clinic, and so we do want to use, them, um, use our money well spent. Now, what about the food trial or allergy test or blood allergy test for food allergies? Okay, when you're triaging these dogs, the bottom line is don't. It is not money well spent. Simply don't do it. Don't even think about it because there's other things that are far more important and are going to give you better answers. Okay, now, been talking about the ick factor, and we can't get away from it. You cannot have a dog going through a triage unless you can absolutely positively make this dog part of the family. These dogs coming into foster care um, or in the shelters, if they smell and they're icky, nobody wants to touch them. They need to be socialized, and they, you need to be able to assess them. And if they've got the ick factor, they simply, you know, they're at a disadvantage. And I see this even with pet dogs with a single family that, you know, a loving family, you know, they're like, well, nobody wants to play with the dog. You know, and the dog's like begging for attention, and they're like, go away, go away. So a couple things to remember. The smell comes from the ears, the anal sex, and the skin folds, greasy skin, or the oral cavity. And, again, no dog is too old to have, its, to have a dental done. You know, and, and that's where you're looking. If you clip the hair, it will debulk the hair that's trapping the odor. Hairs that are all greasy and full of bacteria smell absolutely horridly. And you get that off, it decreases the itch tremendously. And the clipping facilitates bathing, and then bathing will make the pet more likable. And amazingly, any bathing relieves itch. And there is no such thing as bathing a dog with skin disease too much. You do not have to worry about drying out the skin. I will talk about my washing technique a little bit later, but I have a two-step washing technique, a pre-wash, and then using a medicated shampoo afterward. Just um, as a heads up, those medicated shampoos, which are really pricey, do not remove the gross debris first. You really need to have a good cleansing shampoo. And always, if any time you bathe a dog, is a good time to clean the ears. You can clean them in between at other times, but cleaning the ears in between at bath time helps a lot. Okay, triage. What is the veterinary plan? If you are looking at these dogs, and we've got parasites, infections, and allergies as the three causes, we want to go after the most likely things first. And the big one are parasites. So be very certain you don't have Demodex because that changes the game plan because then you have to add a Demodex treatment protocol in here. But if you don't have Demodex, the best option is to treat for fleas and contagious mites concurrently. You can use Celamectin, but you want to use it every two weeks for six weeks, maybe even eight weeks, or Moxidexin and Metoclopramide every two weeks for six weeks. 
these are this is the best, most cost effective protocol for treating for fleas and contagious mites together and making sure everybody else in contact is also on, on flea control. And then you want to treat for skin infections because if they're that itchy that they're drawing your attention to it, you're either going to know you have an infection because you've seen it cytologically or you're absolutely going to know it clinically because you, know, you see the scales and crust. So we're going to want to be bathing that animal, if we can, at least three times a week during this six-week you know, triage plan. We have to make a decision about using systemic antifungals, and the one you want to use is ketoconazole. And I use 10 milligrams per kilogram, excuse me, 5 milligrams per kilogram um, once a day for four weeks. The 10 milligrams per kilogram is going to get you into trouble with sick dogs. Stay at 5, and they come in a 200 milligram tablet, always giving them with food because that helps absorption. And then systemic antibiotics, if you need, if they've had a big history of of antibiotic usage or you suspect it, um, then do it based upon culture. Otherwise, you can use cephalexin as your first choice. But again, you know, 30 milligrams per kilogram and do it for four weeks. Just doing seven days or 14 days is going to get you into the relapse cycle. And as you can see here, we're not using steroids um, in these dogs. Okay. And again, this is going to seem like overkill. Somebody's like, well, you're doing too many things at one time. True, true. But scabies is up there with that super, super itch. And the other thing is a combined bacterial yeast infection is actually indistinguishable in the itch that dogs get from scabies. You can't tell. So if you're dealing with an itchy dog, you might as well treat for both. Infection control and parasite control is where you want to go, and it's going to solve a lot of problems for you. Now, what do you do when you can't use systemic antibiotics for whatever reason? Maybe you have done a culture and it's resistant to all of the available antibiotics that you can afford to give orally. Um, maybe oral antibiotics are simply not a financial option. We can treat this, these dogs topically. It takes a lot more muscle power. But first things first, focal topical therapy with an antibiotic ointment like mupirocin or triple antibiotic can be used on focal areas that are very, very um, inflamed. And then you can do whole body treatment. You can cure resistant bacterial infections with chlorhexidine baths daily or every other day and also using regular chlorhexidine uh, solution, putting it in a spray bottle and using it between baths. Um, accelerated hydrogen peroxide in the same way is also a very good option, a whole body treatment followed by a spray. You know, how, many, how much is too much? What can you bathe? Well, let's just see it. You know, two to three times a week is ideal if this is the only thing you can do and then using whatever spray you're using intermittently daily. But we'll talk about some of the options here. Now, for the shelter staff in here, that, the, the number one thing you can do, if you can't bathe every two to three weeks, then get that dog's coat clipped so that you can facilitate and make the best use of your bathing at least once a week really, really well. Um, and here you want to use, start with a cleansing shampoo, and that's any kind of cleansing shampoo. And flea shampoos are great cleansing shampoos. They remove the debris. And... Then you want to follow it with a medicated shampoo. Now, the trick here to getting really good shampooing uh, effect is to pre-dilute the shampoo before applying. Never, ever, ever use a shampoo directly out of the bottle because it can cause an irritant reaction, and it's, you get this concentrated glob of shampoo on the top of the dog that you can't rinse off. And guess what? Shampoo residue is itchy. and the, It causes a contact reaction. It's itchy. So if you pre-dilute it, and you got the dog wet, then you're applying an even concentration all over your dog, and you can lather them up, and then you can go ahead. It's easy to rinse off. And the key here is massage, massage, massage. I wash these dogs from the nose to the tail, tail to the nose, top to bottom, bottom to top, and that mechanical massaging removes the debris. Rinse the dog, and then do exactly the same thing with your medicated shampoo. And then if you can do this once a week, then in between, Spray the dog with one of those medicated shampoos. Everybody has, usually everybody has chlorhexidine um, solution available. Do that. Okay. Now, foster families, what's the plan? First of all, make sure all your pets, dogs and cats, are on flea control. And actually, you know, go ahead and retreat everybody. Make sure they're there. If the animal hasn't been clipped or groomed, get it clipped, brush it, comb it, because you'll cut down on the smell, and will facilitate bathing. These animals need your attention. They've usually been pretty much, you know, ostracized because they, they have the ick factor. 
and bathe. You cannot dry out the skin. Um, get your parasite control plan on board. Follow that. Follow the infection control. And then go to the website and, pit in, and keep one of those itch scales. And then on there, make your notes. You know, the dog is really itchy at number 10, and, you know, and I started this treatment. Where is it at every change in the therapy? And absolutely, positively, do not change the diet. Make no diet changes. Get your patient, your, your family member here on a complete and balanced diet. Um, this is not the time to do food trials or anything. This dog needs groceries, needs good quality groceries. And you want to get them on a diet that he likes or she likes, that doesn't give them gas, and they has good stools. Um, and is obviously affordable. Okay, so what happens with your triage? Where are we six weeks later? Well, if we've got a negative trichogram, we've got Demodex off the table, and if we've gone, done this uh, parasite treatment, all the other parasites of concern are, are gone. We've, we've treated for them. And if we've gone with our topical therapy um, for bacterial infections and antifungal therapy, either systemically or topically, we have yeast and bacterial infections off the board. Now, for those of you who are still worried about ringworm, ketoconazole is very effective in dogs for dermatophytes. So if you've missed it, we've treated for it. And um, some recent research out of my laboratory has shown that you don't have to use lime sulfur. as the only thing topically. Those antibacterial shampoos that have got an antifungal in there are very effective topically. So six weeks later, you've attacked these two things. The first thing is you may have a happy situation, well, in a happy place, okay, and that's great. Then what do you do? Well, then you're basically in a watch and wait and document. You can obviously report this to whoever um, is doing it, and, and this patient is, is good, and you're just going to watch and wait. And so what are you doing? Okay, well, what happened there is the first question you should be asking. Well, why is this dog better? Well, it's better because what you were caught in is a cycle of itch and infection. The dog was itchy. There was a trigger. It triggered infections, bacterial and yeast. Those things are really itchy, and the dog is, is you know, is, there's this perpetual cycle, and the dog is better. Did it have scabies? I don't know. It might have. Um, but the dog, you've done reasonable treatment. This is a, these are diagnostic response to treatment trials, and the itch has stopped. Therefore, where we are is at um, a place where you may be totally done. The, you write a summary you know, of everything that's been done, products and application, and you just wait and see if there's any change. Don't stop flea control. Keep that going. Again, do not change the food. This is not the time to change the food because now we've got a dog. We've clipped the hair coat. We've got through infections. The skin uses 25% of the, of the protein on the intake. Dog's doing better. It needs that good nutrition to the skin to get hair regrowth going and get, and, and get the epidermal lipids and everything going. And then watch for signs of any relapse. And the first thing you're looking for for a relapse is that rash. Do you see that scale? Because at this point, you don't really know for sure if it's just a one-time trigger. You're hoping that it is. And the longer you go with the dog doing really, really well, the more likely it is that it's probably a one-time trigger. The other option is, is it could be that the trigger is seasonal. And we see a lot of dogs that come in for you know long histories, years of histories of year-round itching. And what we find out is we go through our triage plan here, and the dog's doing great, we follow them along, 